Hi, I'm Russ Kappler, coming to you from Angel MD's Alpha Conference, where I'm very pleased to have as my guest, Dr. Jeffrey Lee, CEO of SunQ. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. You bet. Tell us about SunQ. Well, SunQ is a startup, uh, and what it really is is that it, it was a um, spin-out from a lot of the work that we had done when I was the, uh, at the agency called DARPA, the Defense Advanced Resource Project Agency. I'd been there for 12 years, and I actually ended up being the founding director of the biotech office. First new office in, uh, since 1990. And My the prior, prior office was the, actually the microprocessing technology office. So it gives you an idea of the impact that DARPA thinks that biotech is now coming into. <clears throat> but SunQ itself really is a multi-purpose uh, company. Really what we do is we do um, uh, uh, a lot of consulting work in terms of uh, advice in terms of the biotech space. Uh, as well as we're actually involved directly in some startups. And so we have uh, uh, three startups that we're involved in. Okay, I want to get into those. but uh, And I assume most of our audience knows about DARPA. But for those that don't, give us an overview. So DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, was really a kind of a, 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 it's an unusual federal agency. It is a agency of the federal government. It's a funding agency. And it's uh, basically a part of the Defense Department. So it's military. Okay. And at the time or that I joined, I was an active duty uh, U.S. Army colonel, all right? Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the role of DARPA is unique. Uh, so DARPA was founded, and this is relevant, uh, shortly after Sputnik went up. And when Sputnik went up, of course, it scared uh, the entire country. And President Eisenhower felt at that time that this was really an insult, uh, because how could the Russians beat the U.S. into space? Um, and so he felt that one of the issues, and there are many, of course, but one of the key issues was that the U.S. R&D community had become conservative. And so he wanted to get rid of that conservatism at certainly at some level. And he created uh, this agency, mm -hmm. which was given just an unbelievable amount of flexibility. And so the flexibility largely is around how they do business with innovators, number one. And number two is how they can move the money. So moving the money is a very key issue, right? And we all know that being in the investing world, that the faster you can move money, especially at early stages with non-dilutive capital, which is government money, it can be transformative. And in fact, that was, in fact, the vehicle of DARPA, how it was able to achieve a lot of the transformative uh, technologies that it is, it is credited with. It was because it's able to move in uh, with that level of efficiency. DARPA is, um, and has a very interesting investing uh, approach that I think is uh, a good model for um, the general community. Number one is DARPA begins with the concept of, is this idea truly cool? Is it a big deal? Not is, could it work or anything, forget that part. Would this, if it worked, be transformative? If the answer is yes, then by golly, try to find a way to make it happen. Now, of course, if you don't have it, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. If you have it, second step, I gotta resource you. Resourcing, of course, starts with money, and that's what all of us in the investing world try to do. The second part, though, is that we also invest technical support. So many startups, as you know, have limited resources, not only in capital, but also in human capital. DARPA recognizes that. We will send in <coughs> a team that may be a PhD in electrical engineering, or a PhD in mechanical engineering, or a PhD in neuroscience, whatever it takes, so that we can help the team succeed. So it's a really interesting model. And you say to yourself, well, give me an example. Wouldn't it be cool for us to have an invisible airplane? Yes. That would be cool. We'd all say, that'd be cool. Right. <clears throat> Something called stealth technology. That was a DARPA program, and we have invisible airplanes. Wouldn't it be cool to have computers all talk to each other around the world? That'd be cool, of course. And that was in 1963, that project was known as the ARPANET, the Advanced Research Project Agencies Network, and of course it's become the internet. Right. Wouldn't it be cool to know where your ships are at sea, whether, there's, whether you can position yourself relative to the, to the stars or the sun, and it's a cloudy day, doesn't matter, wouldn't you love to know exactly where your ship is in the middle of the ocean? Sure. Absolutely, that'd be cool. Yep. Called Trident was the first uh, GPS satellite that was a satellite sent up for purely for positioning. That was yep. a Navy DARPA project. Right. And of course, it gave rise to what we know as GPS. Right. And on and on this goes. Right. So it all starts with, is it cool, Russ? Right, I love it. So it's also kind of interesting that you say non-dilutive uh, capital. I mean, it's really good if you have a technology and have DARPA come in as an investor. They just give you money and expertise, and they expect you to be successful. That's exactly right. That's the government role, I think. Yeah. Well, the government role is using taxpayer dollars uh, to enable these kinds of technologies, these kinds of companies right. to blossom, right. <clears throat> and for no other reason than to provide that capability. Right. Remember, we're not building a thing. We're building a thing that gives you a capability. 
And then for DARPA's world, of course, there's a capability for national security, an invisible airplane, that sure, sort of thing. Sure. But when you build that capability, you would say, well, what's the ROI other than the obvious intellectual one? Right. Well, the ROI is very simple. Yeah. The government it hopes that Russ's company survives, hopes that Russ's company blossoms, hopes that Russ's company will in fact sell many, many products because you know why? The government will tax him. Right. And the government gets right. back its ROI. Right. Furthermore, we want right. Russ to build this big, big company that's gonna make all these products because he's gonna employ lots of Americans because guess what? We're gonna tax them too. Right. So right. the tax man and the government always gets theirs. Yeah. So what sort of things did you see after you started this health tech, the, the biotech uh, category that are coming that you can talk about? We had a project where, um, and it came out from my own wartime experience. You know, mm -hmm. I served, my first combat deployment was in 2003 when I went to Afghanistan, and that was just before I joined DARPA. So I joined DARPA between the time that I was sent to Afghanistan and I was sent to Iraq. So I went to Afghanistan, it was a very transformative time for me. I ran the intensive care unit at the 452nd Combat Support Hospital in the northwest corner of, of the country. And during that time, I took care of uh, service members but also took care of a lot of Afghans. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't, not a single day went by that there wasn't a young Afghan a child that was brought to us or, or in my ICU missing uh, a, a, a body part. And it was largely because of the plethora of Russian landmines mm -hmm. that were throughout mm -hmm. the country. But you realize that the child will survive, but missing an arm or leg in the very difficult environment that Afghanistan is, uh, their likelihood of, uh, of surviving, right. quite frankly, to adulthood is very low, yeah. very low. And it's, yeah. and it's, it, it's just tragic, right. it's tragic. I mean, in, even in our country, loss of a limb is a disability, but it doesn't mean that it's a right. life-threatening disability. Right. But anyway, I came back to the country and said, this is just not right. And then, of course, we did see that our own service members were getting hurt by IEDs and missing limbs. Well, medically, what's available, is, of course, is the prosthetics we're all mm -hmm. familiar with. And those are really not very functional. So we said to ourselves, you know, what is it that we really want? Again, what would be cool? What would be cool would be an arm like Luke Skywalker or Del Spooner have, right? right. It looks like an arm, right. functions like an arm, and you control it like an arm. In other words, when you think about it, that's how it moves. You don't use twitching body parts and all this to make the thing open and close. That's not yeah. it. Yeah. Right? So we said, let's go do this. Let's create a research project to build a replacement arm, like Luke Skywalker's. And we did. And there were really, if you look at it, it you say to yourself, it's really daunting. But it's actually not so bad. It, it's hard, but it's not improbable. And what I mean by that is we said, what would it take to do this? It takes really just two things. One is robotics, and the other is neuroscience. If I can tap into the brain, decode those electrical signals that control my native arm, but now instead use it to control my robot arm, I've got it. So it, it's, it, is, it, is, it becomes a tractable problem when you just break it down into those two, two silos. So we work with some of the best roboticists we have in the country, we work with some of the best neuroscientists in the country, and lo and behold, we were able to create that platform. And it was wildly successful. Uh, you know, it, it's been featured um, you know, throughout the medical community, but certainly 60 Minutes has carried it forward, mm -hmm. CBS Morning News has carried it forward, and on and on it goes. Mm -hmm. And there are people now who have mm -hmm. uh, uh, Christopher Reeve type of injuries, quadriplegics, right with these arms and now you can imagine how transformative for them to control right. a brain, an arm with their brain to feed themselves, work a TV remote and the like. And that was great. However, it opened a new opportunity because what have we done? We've got the brain controlling a robot arm. We've got the brain controlling a robot. That changes things dramatically because now the way you and I interact with our environment is with our hands and our feet. If I can directly interact my brain to, the, to an environment through a tertiary device, I can bypass a lot of the control mechanisms that we use. Can I fly an airplane directly with my brain? Can I drive a car and on and close? And the short answer is yes, and we demonstrated it. Wow. And so what that means is, is in the next 5, 10, 20 years, what, what else can we control directly with our minds? Mm -hmm. And it opens a, a tremendous space that even you and I can't think of all the possibilities, right. and that is cool. Ah, it is. Share your perspective on what AngelMD is doing. AngelMD is, I, I really, it, this is my first exposure to AngelMD. Okay. I was brought in by my medical school uh, friend, uh, Bill Hirota, who said, you've got to come to this conference. Okay. It's like amazing. Okay. And he was absolutely right. What AngelMD is addressing all the levels of uh, friction, I think. I mean, that, that's what's great about this conference. It's not just about, oh, this is cool tech, we should invest in right. it. But AngelMD is thinking about how to invest wisely, which is what we're always talking about, but also, how, what's the exit strategy? What is the development plan? What is the long-term impact? All these things, every level, 
is actually be addressed in this conference, which to me is remarkable. Right, because we often think only at the front end. Oh yeah. Right. Oh yeah. The second thing that I think about Angel MD, which is really amazing, is you're not the the investors themselves is a rather eclectic group. You have physicians in here, you have administrators, hospital mm -hmm. administrators in here, you have people who are are very well versed in the in the mm -hmm. investment area of healthcare, and of course you have your traditional investors who are coming in, right. taking op the opportunity of working with this very eclectic group, who because of their diverse nature, right. I think are probably going to be the smartest in terms of how to do this. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're going to leverage against each other. So they'll know a doctor who's an expert in that space. That same doctor may have no idea how to do the business development, but you have another guy who does, and on and on it goes. Jeffrey, I really appreciate uh, your perspective on all what's going on right now in healthcare. Thank you so much. You bet. And that wraps up my discussion with Dr. Jeffrey Ling, CEO of SunQ, here at Angel MD's Alpha Conference. 